Hi, everyone. Welcome back to um, fun and wonderful world of microbiology. I'm Lauren Yost, and I'm happy to be discussing chemistry with you guys today. So let's jump into it. What? Okay, so um, chemistry. I can. There we go. All right, today we're going to be discussing the uh, properties of subatomic particles, distinguishing the features of different chemical bonds, defining what pH is. It's a very important concept in biology, so it is something that you guys are going to have to be familiar with, and I mean very familiar with. Um, the four main families of bio, biochemical molecules is what that's going to say, uh, providing the examples of cell components that are made from those biochemical groups, and then differentiating between the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels of protein structure. So fun times. So what are atoms and what does that mean? Um, basically atoms, um, we're talking about protons. I made of protons and neutrons at the nucleus. So it should be equal number of protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge while neutrons have a nu neutral charge. Um, and then on the outside, we have what essentially we call a cloud of electrons, and they can exist in certain levels within that cloud and um, be a certain number based on um, whatever that atom is. And electrons themselves have a negative charge, again, floating around that essentially positively charged nu nucleus. All right talking about the different kinds of bonds between atoms. And, you know, if we're going to be talking about molecules and biochemistry and everything like that, then we need to understand what a bond even is and what that means at all, like chemically speaking on the molecular level. So what are the three main kinds of bonds that we'll be talking about in microbiology and generally speaking, uh, biochemistry? We're talking about covalent bonds. Um, these are whenever electrons are shared between two atoms. So if you have a single bond, we have one sharing its electron with the other and the other sharing its electron with that one. So they could be on either side at any given time at any moment. They could spend more time on one side than the other, and that can sometimes give um, a little bit of a charge to things. And that's very important in chemistry. And we will be um, discussing that in the hydrogen bonds. But um, that's the idea there. So if they're sharing more, um, double that, and then we're talking about a double bond, obviously. So that's what covalent bonds are. In covalent bonds, they are, you know, um, being like co, like co-parenting, like co-partnering, or whatever you want to call it, working together. They are sharing. Okay. Ionic bonds. We have um, one atom donating its electron to the other atom literally giving it up to the other atom in the case of like, you could have sodium chloride, right? So sodium chloride, sodium is Na. So let's write that here, just so we can just kind of visualize it a little bit better, Na. And then um, chlorine would be the Cl. And essentially like the Na, the sodium is going to give its electron to the chlorine. And what happens is that um, those molecules can dissociate and the chlorine will have a negative charge because it has an uh, an extra electron giving it, you know, an extra uh, negative charge from that electron. And then the sodium atom will have a positive charge because it lost that electron to chloride. So then these can interact in water quite well because they are charged and charged things interact well with water. Um, things that are not charged at all don't interact well with water. And we'll talk about that concept as well. So that's the idea with the ionic bonds. We have a donating of electrons going on. One donates its electron to the other atom. Okay, so that was the ionic bond. In the hydrogen bond, we're talking about um, basically, like I was telling you with the covalent bonds, um, you might have an uh, atom on one side, here that is going to hog the electron from the hydrogen, mostly onto its side. So that electron is going to be floating around on that side, giving it a uh, sort of a negative pull, but that more importantly, gives the hydrogen a positive aspect. And this is a very important trait of hydrogen in um, atoms like this, because that allows it to have that positive aspect to it. 
and it only has one electron to it at all. Like that's all it has. And so it's pretty common for it to get that if the other atom is likely to pull electrons away and hog it, so to speak. It's not necessarily being donated permanently, like what we see with sodium and chloride. It's just being hogged onto one end of it. Um, so that um, hydrogen gets that positive charge anyway, even though it's still attached to the other molecule. And that allows that positive inter that positive hydrogen to interact with negative things that are out there in its environment. All right, yeah, not that kind of bond. I forgot even that was there. Um, okay, so moving on to um, covalent bonds. Um, like we were saying, uh, sharing is not always equal. So that is saying that one can hog electrons more than the other, and that would give that positive aspect to that hydrogen, which is kind of almost losing that electron, not permanently, but just you know, in, in a way, uh, not using it as often as the oxygen would be in this case, this oxygen's hogging it so that it would be negatively charged. This is a water molecule. This is how water exists. Like I, I you know, shouldn't have to say that, but um, you guys now are more aware of why water is so important in biology. It's because it gets these charges. It gets the positives at the hydrogens and the negatives at the oxygens. And that allows water to interact with um, other charged molecules really well, or to not interact well with things that are not charged. And that's important too. Yeah. Because like, if they aren't going to mix well either, then that can affect how things behave as well. So this is showing how water molecules will interact with each other whenever they're in you know, water, liquid form, um, or just in general, honestly. Um, so showing that negative oxygen interacting with the hydrogens um, of other molecules. And that attraction there is that hydrogen bond. So that negative oxygen and with that hydrogen that's positive, that's a hydrogen bond. Okay, so that's not an actual exchange of electrons. I wanna make that clear when we were talking about the bonds over here. Um, this is not an exchange of electrons in this bond. It's just like an attractive force, but it is a significant and has a you know large effect on molecules. Okay, no sharing, no exchanging, just um, interactions between the you know, attractions. So this is that depicting the ionic bonds and the, the transfer of the electron or the donation of the electron there. This is like a salt crystal in this picture down here in the, in the kind of middle. Um, and then if you put it into water, it's going to dissolve out and release those ions. So that's what ions are. Um, one of them has lost an electron. One of them has gained an electron. So they're charged particles and they're gonna associate with water because of those charges. Okay, and it's just showing the ways that the hydrogens um, are going to be associated with whatever that charge molecule is. So in this case, we have the positive sodium on the left here, and the oxygens with the negative charge want to be near it, and the hydrogens with the positive charge are kind of going to face away. It's the opposite for the chlorine on the right, right? Because that has a negative charge. Hydrogens are positive. They want to interact. So we can have different kinds of solutions. This sort of breaks us down into that idea of things being hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Um, essentially, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to check. Um, essentially what we're talking about um, here is hydrophilic as water loving and hydrophobic as water fearing, exactly like what it sounds like. So hydrophilic, these molecules will have some sort of usually a polar or charged similar concept there. Okay, don't get too confused, but if they have a charge or um, a polar aspect, a positive and a negative aspect to them, they can interact well with the water that also has those charges. If it's hydrophobic, there's no polar aspect to that molecule. So it doesn't interact well with that charges on the water that's hydrophobic. And what is an example of a hydrophobic thing? Well, oil. Oil doesn't mix with water. That's mostly made up of fats. It's long chains of carbons and hydrogens. Those don't have charges. And so they are water fearing, um, hydrophobic, okay? There are some molecules out there that we would call amphipathic. These are incredibly important in biology. Amphipathic, just think of like an amphibian, right? So what did, where do amphibians live? They live on the land and in the water, right? So it's two ways they can live. So same way with the amphipathic molecules, they can have a charged end and a end that is um, hydrophobic. 
it won't interact well with water. So part of it won't interact well, the other part will. So that's really important with um, phospholipids in the membranes. So um, this question is gonna ask, what type of bond is formed between two atoms that share electrons? Um, and then uh, that's gonna be talking about the covalent bonds obviously, because we, that's the ones that share. Remember, ionic is donating hydrogen. We're not exchanging any of that at all. And, um, uh, and we didn't talk about Van der Waals forces. So no worries there. All right, so now we're gonna get into pH. What is it? What is pH? What does that mean? What are we measuring? I know you can say all day long, oh, you know what we're talking about. Like you might even get the idea of an acid or a base, but what is an acid? What does that mean to be an acid? What does it mean to be a base? What exactly is going on there at the molecular level? So yeah, we're gonna talk about that and you're gonna understand it, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully you're gonna understand it. It is complicated. And so we're gonna try to go through it slowly. Um, so yeah, pH is going to be assessing, you know, acidity and alkalinity. So alkalinity is like uh, basic or, you know, higher pH of alkaline. So what is pH? This is the equation for pH. Yes. And I know it looks, you know, daunting a bit, but pH basically equals the negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen ions in that solution. So if we have a certain number of hydrogen ions, that would be our um, brackets around the H plus, that's hydrogen concentration in something, whatever water or I know a mixture of acid or whatever it is, usually dissolved in water, but um, whatever it is that um, has a certain concentration of hydrogen ions in it. And if we take that and base it on a 10 scale and then invert it, that's what pH is, okay? So that's the hydrogen concentration there. The log is the 10 scale, the negative is an inversion. And so what do I mean by that exactly? Well, we're gonna look at the numbers and hopefully that'll be a little bit more clear. Here, we are talking about the amount of um, hydrogen atoms in a solution essentially. So it says moles per liter of hydrogen ions. I don't need you guys to worry about that too much. Just think about how much hydrogen ions that would be compared to whatever the middle is or the uh, higher end is or whatever. So we start in the middle. Our neutral, our like kind of middle go-to start here is seven. That is what um, water is. Distilled water is a 7.0, okay? So that's kind of like the, your baseline here. So anything lower than that is gonna be an acid. So anything lower, so the lower numbers here, these are pHs. That's the number that I'm talking about being lower, okay? So if the pH is lower, these are acids. And then anything higher in pH, that's the, these numbers um, on this area down here, that is the base, okay? So we range anywhere from zero to 14 and seven is neutral. So that's the idea of, the what's going on with the number when I talk to you about the actual number and the general concept of pH, okay? What does it actually mean? Because I told you I was going to tell you what it actually means and why we call it a seven or why we call it a 14 or why we call it a two or whatever. Yeah, we're going to talk about that too. So we said we we're talking about hydrogen concentrations, okay? So if we have hydrogen ions, high hydrogen ion concentration, that is, if we're talking about high hydrogen con ion concentration, since I can't write out to the right, I didn't really think this through, but high hydrogen concentration, that one is acid, more acidic, the higher the um, hydrogen concentration, the more acidic, the lower the hydrogen concentration, more basic. Now there's a reverse side to it. We're not just talking about hydrogen ions. We're also talking about hydroxyl groups or hydroxide. And that's just an OH group. Cause like when we talk about what's water, it's H2O, right? So we're talking about breaking up water into these sort of functional pieces. So if we're talking about H plus, that's the H plus by itself. And we're talking about the OH by itself as well. So that's H2O, right? So the more H plus there is in a solution, and that can be introduced by other molecules or by um, causing the 
uh, water itself in that environment to be kind of donating out those hydrogens or however you want to look at it that's not as important if that solution has more free h plus floating around in it it's more acidic if it has less it's more basic the inverse can be said of the oh because the oh is like its opposite okay that's what that's about the oh is the opposite of the h plus okay so now we got that idea down pH is literally a measure of the hydrogen concentration. So I said the more hydrogen ions, the um, lower the pH, because that's the more acidic, right? Acid, closer to zero you go, more and more acidic, okay? Why does it work that way? Well, essentially we're talking about if we had one mole per liter of hydrogen ions, that's more than 0.00001 right? Obviously you can see that number. That's the, those are decimals there. So those are smaller numbers as we go further on down this little mess of a, a like pyramid of numbers. So they we're starting up here with the most. So that's the most hydrogen ions. The logarithm of that is 10 to the negative zero or 10 to the zero, same number. And that number is just well, zero. Okay. If we had 10 to the negative one, that is 10, where you have moved that um, decimal place over, and we keep moving it over by one every step that we go. So that's basically what it is. So we're talking about 10. So when I say, you know, one to 0 0.1 to 0.01 to 0 0.001 to 0 0.001, that's 0 001, that's three numbers. So that is um, going to be uh, this one here, 0 001, that's 10 to the negative three. So you counted out those three, that's a pH of three. So we just take that number of that. If it's 10 to the negative two, we take that number, the two up in that exponent, and that's now your pH number. So that's what we're looking at. So that's why the higher the number that we're getting, that we're talking about, like if we're talking about pH of 14, pH of 14 means 10 to the negative 14 molecules per liter of hydrogen atoms. And 10 to the negative 14 is a lot less than 10 to the negative zero, right? We can all agree on that. Um, and that's the idea of the mass behind it. So definitely be aware of that concept. Definitely know that seven is your neutral. Anything less is acid. Anything more is base. Know that like the back of your hand, please. Because we're going to be using it a lot. And I'm not joking. A lot in the lab anyways. We'll be talking about it continuously throughout. So moving on. We have, um, you know, acidic solutions, uh, releasing excess hydrogen ions. Basic, we're releasing excess hydroxyl ions. So opposites, essentially, right? So more basic. Um, then we have the pH scale talking about it in a base of 10. We can look at this chart here and it shows us just common things that you might normally think of and where they would fall on that scale. Um, the lower pH stuff towards the zeros, we've got 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. Remember our stomach has hydrochloric acid in it. And that's gonna be on that lower end of the scale. Things that might be on the higher end, you know, milk of magnesia and household ammonia. Ammonia is very basic. So that's an, you know, a concept there or literally just straight up potassium hydroxide, very basic as well. So. Uh, this question is going to ask us, as you increase the pH, the concentration of the hydrogen ions, will it increase or will it decrease? So um, if you're increasing the pH, your hydrogen ions should be decreasing. So I did not reset those. So that's why it's showing up with these weird numbers. Okay. Um, it's not a big deal. It's not what we're here for, we're here to learn about the concepts, um, not to play games with our little clickers. Um, so chemistry of carbon. So carbon is like the backbone of everything organic. So when I talk to you about organic chemistry and, and biochemistry, biochemistry is organic chemistry. Um, it's just dealing with literally just the, um, you know, biological parts of it. So uh, we can have anything that has a carbon and hydrogen backbone, essentially. So both carbon and hydrogen form the, the main portion of that molecule, form the backbone of that molecule, that's an organic molecule everything else is inorganic. So these guys here, sodium chloride, no carbon, no hydrogen. We have magnesium phosphate, that that is, um, uh, sorry, a brain fart for a second. 
uh, that obviously it has no carbon and no hydrogen. I was thinking of something else. Um, here we have calcium carbonate that has carbon in it. Yeah, but it is not organic because there's no hydrogens involved in that. And then we have carbon dioxide. There's no hydrogens involved. It's not an organic molecule technically. Yes, there are molecules that are involved in life that are not organic. They might be important to life, but they don't, they aren't all organic just because they are involved in life. I want to make that clear too. Okay. Organic chemicals, um, carbon and hydrogen framework. Where we start out here with methane, uh, carbon with four hydrogens. That's our most basic one. Carbon likes to make four bonds. It makes it the happiest and it makes it the most stable. It's one of the most stable molecules that there is. Um, here we have octane. Why is it called octane? Oct, like octopus. That's like eight, right? Octagon. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight carbons. And then all the appropriate hydrogens to fill out all the bonds that carbon likes to make, which is four total single bonds, or you can, you know, distribute that between double bonds, however you like. So that's the idea with that. And then we have a circular form of it down here, which is a benzene ring. These are pretty common structures that we see in biology. So that's another one to be pretty familiar with, I think. Um, and then we have some very, very like going up to extremely large molecules, things like antibodies. Antibodies themselves are actually pretty small as far as a protein, functional protein can go. But, um, you know, we're talking about molecular weight of a million there just for an antibody. So yeah. That can be huge molecules. We're talking about based on that carbon hydrogen backbone. Other molecules can come in and function with it. So why are we, why would carbon be so important in life? What is its like special aspect that would make it so useful in that way? Well, we're talking about an atom that's really stable. Um, it forms its four little bonds. It's very predictable. It doesn't get really picky as far as like stealing away, you know, hogging those hydrogens from those electrons from hydrogen or anything like that. It's just nice happy, predictable, stable, four bonds. It's, it's, real, it's real good for building like the backbones of these molecules. So we consider that ideal for that. And then, um, so yeah, it's four electrons in its outer orbital can be shared with other atoms in those covalent bonds. It includes other carbon molecules, of course. So how do we get all these different functions from these carbon hydrogen based molecules? So we're not just including carbons and hydrogens here right? And how those carbons and hydrogens interlink with other molecules and with each other, that's going to determine how that molecule behaves overall. And when we're talking about these massive molecules, that can have a massive effect on how they will behave, um, on how like charge portions can interact with other charge portions or how, you know, portions that don't like water will interact with other portions that don't like water. And that can cause those molecules, those massive molecules to sort of fold in on each other because they want to interact with things that are like each other. So that's why we get these shapes of these different proteins. That's just based on how these um, parts of the molecule are going to interact. So what are some of those functional groups that can allow the molecule to interact differently within itself or with other molecules? Well, these functional, first of all, the functional groups are molecular groups. They're accessory molecules that help binding with or other organic molecules or um, within themselves. So they confer um, different reactive properties. They might react differently when we add on an oxygen, right? Oxygen usually tends to have that negative charge to it. So things are going to interact differently with it now that we're introducing that oxygen. Um, and then moving on with, um, with how you can kind of predict certain parts will react based on their functional groups. Some of them that you might want to be familiar with the hydroxyl group is the OH group. It's hydroxyl. So we see that in alcohols. So if I were to talk to you, the rule here, and you don't have to know this rule, but I'm just going to go lay it, lay it down for you. Um, the first four of organic, you know, molecules, um, uh, basics are, you know, methyl for one carbon, ethyl for two carbons, propyl for three carbons and butyl for four carbons. And then, you know, we can go over from there um, based on how many carbons there are going to be, but that's the idea with the first ones. So methyl would just be one. Well, if I was going to make you a, a molecule that looks like this, there's hydrogens off of here and a hydrogen off of here and a hydrogen off of here. And um, yeah, we're going to keep going. 
We're almost there, I promise. Just hang with me. So those are all the hydrogens off of our carbon. It's a happy carbon um, and hydrogen thing. And now we're gonna introduce this. This OH that we've tacked on to the end of it here, this is a hydroxyl group. When you add the hydroxyl group onto the end like this, that makes this an alcohol. And what, um, you know, what kind of alcohol would this particular one be? Like I just said to you guys, methyl is one, ethyl is two, propyl is three, butyl is four. So this is ethyl alcohol or ethanol. Ethanol is drinking alcohol. So that's what I just drew on this for you. Um, so that's uh, the importance of knowing like hydroxyl groups. Um, that's pretty important in alcohols or also in carbohydrates. They have a lot of these OH groups just kind of sticking out in their little carbohydrate sugar rings. And you will see those too. Um, the carboxyl groups, we have this double bond with the oxygen as well as this hydroxyl group on there. That is a carboxyl. This gives an acidic property. This is what we see at the ends of fatty acids and stuff like that. And we have this a lot throughout proteins. When I talk to you guys about amino acids, an amino acid has this COOH kind of set up um, as the acid portion of amino acid. What does the amino part of amino acid mean? If we figured out the acid part, the amino part is down here, it's just the NH2. So that N is a nitrogen group and it has hydrogens on there. It has a more of a positive aspect to it uh, as opposed to the negative aspect of the um, oxygens above on that uh, carboxyl group, okay? These are important to understand, at least conceptually, so that you guys know what's going on whenever we're talking about proteins and how they might interact and how they might um, you know, fold up or, or bond with other things or associate with other things or recognize other things, stuff like that. Cause they don't have binds. They aren't thinking these things. It's literally all based on molecular interactions. So when you think about it that way, an antibody that's floating around in your body, protecting you from getting infected with, I don't know, the flu or something or the measles um, that you got from your vaccine, your body built up these antibodies. It's a massive protein that is gonna go around and I say, we'll recognize measles if you were exposed to it and get rid of it before you were ever really truly infected. But the way that that works is literally, it's just like folded up molecules atoms that are interacting with other atoms are folded up in a certain way. They're folded so specifically just to recognize the measles. And when they come and recognize it and they bind to it, they're associating usually through hydrogen bonds. And that can, when that association comes up, cause structural changes in the rest of the protein. When it says, you know, it's sort of like a lock and a key mechanism, it's the coolest stuff. So that's how organic chemistry and how biochemistry really works. It's important to kind of get that when you're talking about microbiology, since these things are so small that this stuff really matters with them. I don't really care as much about you guys knowing esters. Sulfhydryl, just be aware that sulfhydryl obviously has sulfur in it. Um, and then phosphate groups are pretty important too. We talk about those a lot in this course. That's just um, a phosphorus group and it just a I almost said that word, a ton of oxygens circled around it, um, giving it the negative aspect to it. Yeah, it's very important. Um, we already talked about this. This was the ethanol. So macromolecules, that's big molecules, yeah. So <laughs> what are the common groups of the big molecules that you're gonna see in this course, especially? Um, so dealing with these large molecules, these carbon and hydrogen based with these oxygens and nitrogens and stuff mixed in appropriately, we're talking about biochemistry. This is the chemistry of life, the chemistry that actually makes up the things that help you and I exist the way that we are. The reason that your eyes are blue instead of green like mine, or yours are brown instead of, you know, kind of a grayish like his, um, that is because of proteins and the way that they are shaped or folded up. And there's they fold up differently, they reflect the light differently. And that's literally how this all works. And that's all encoded by your genes. Your genes say, make this protein. This protein gets spit out in this long little chain by your ribosomes. And then it starts folding in on itself just right away. And how it folds up and decides to sit and behave determines what it does. Cool stuff. So, um, and then the genes might be different. They might fold up a little bit differently and behave differently. So moving on the basic, the basic compounds of biochemistry, carbohydrates, that's our sugar-based stuff, lipids, that's our fat-based stuff, 
proteins, proteins, <laughs> amino acid-based proteins. Um, and so we already hit our macros, right? <laughs> and then we have nucleic acids. That's your DNA and your RNA, your genes, and then the messengers for those and like how those are all going to function in your, in your whole, whole thing. So a polymer, that term means it's a large molecule made up of repeating subunits called monomers. This is not meant to be a trick. If I were to ask you about the polymer of, you know, something and it's uh, monomers, like a polymer, that's literally like a poly means a lot, right? A lot of mers. So what are the single units of a polymer? A monomer. And I know that seems simple right now but people get tricked on that question. I'm not trying to trick anybody, but they trip themselves up. You overthink sometimes, overanalyze. So um, just, you know, know it well and you won't be confused. So um, moving on, this is just a chart talking about like the different kinds of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids that you could be exposed to in biochemistry. I'm not gonna break it down right here. Um, please do look over it and like kind of at least be familiar with what these terms are um, and be able to recognize, you know, if I were to be talking about glucose, you should know that that is a carbohydrate. You should know that. So if it's sugars, right? So we know glucose is a sugar, you know, that fructose is a sugar. If it's something like that, maltose, lactose, sucrose, all of these are sugars. Yeah. That's a carbohydrate. It's the same thing. Okay. So you can have monosaccharides, meaning like if it's a monosaccharide, it's like one sugar unit. Disaccharides might be two sugar units together. So you would take two of the monosaccharides, stick them together. You can give them a new name, like lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide. It's got two of them stuck together. Um, glucose and galactose are the two that are stuck together in lactose. Um, and then moving on, uh, sucrose is your table sugar. So that's glucose and fructose. So yeah, I mean, these are actually like, you see this stuff in your everyday life. The lipids, we are talking about fats and oils and things like that. Very important for membranes. And it's a super important concept to understand. Um, proteins are structural and they perform metabolic functions. Most of anything that goes on in your body, sorry, I have a hair in my mouth. is going to be driven by some sort of action of a protein. So, you know, go, go figure with that one. Um, and then nucleic acids, heredity. I don't know. They code for things, right? So carbohydrates, we just did this. Saccharide, sugar, a monosaccharide is that one unit. Disaccharide, hook two of them together. Polysaccharide, a whole junk bowl, right? So that is uh, uh, kind of depicting what we were just talking about. We have a glucose molecule over here on this side. We have galactose over here on this side. And then we've joined them by something called an aldehyde group to make a uh, disaccharide, which is what this is like a more simpler, simple drawing of that. Okay. Same exact thing in all of these pictures, believe it or not, but yeah, um, that's that. And so down here we have a polysaccharide. It's just a bunch of them all linked together and, and a bunch of different branches and all that. Cool. All right. Lipids, fats, phospholipids, and waxes. A lipid is not soluble in polar solvents, right? It's so like water is a polar solvent, but you can dissolve it in non-polar solvents like um, other hydrocarbon type liquids, okay? These are gonna have long chains of hydrocarbons, which is hydrogens and carbons, right? They are hydrophobic in those chains. So that's the idea here with the lipids. They have long chains that are hydrophobic. They don't interact well with water. Um, and that's the whole point of their existence. Like that's why they do what they do because they don't do well with water. They're not going to allow um, charged molecules to pass through very well, at least not just freely, right? Including water. So um, this allows for us to make like membranes and stuff like that that keeps things out. It's nice because a phospholipid gives us the um, that amphipathic property. Remember that word. So it's amphipathic, a phospholipid, just what it sounds like. we got a long fatty group, a long tail that is hydrophobic, doesn't do well with water. And then we have our head, which is the phosphate group, which is charged, right? So we've got that charged head and that is going to have a negative uh, charge to it. And it can interact with those hydrogens in the water solution, loves the polar stuff and all that. So how does a membrane work? How does it come together? Well, it works specifically because of that 
chemical makeup of that single molecule. So all of the charged little yellow, orangey heads of these, where did my cursor go? Um, I don't know where it went. Anyways, all of these charged molecules, I don't understand. Oh, my thing died. Okay, well, we'll try to make it through without a mouse. Um, all of these uh, charged molecules, like you can see the little yellow orange heads um, in the little circle in like that figure number one, um, that the heads having the charge, they'll stick together and they'll stick on the water side. And you can see that again in figure two, that they're all lined up. The orange the uh, polar heads, charged heads are gonna be all up against with one another because they like, you know, polar likes polar and they like the water too. That's protecting the inside, which is those lipid, um, hydrophobic lipid tails and um, keeping them away from that charged water, which they don't want to be, they're hydrophobic, right? They're water fearing. So they get to stick on the inside together. And that whole aspect of them is what allows a lipid bilayer to form. And you can see in that picture on the left that they have, if you like kind of separate it apart, that's the um, tails of one side and then the tails of the other side kind of being peeled apart to show you kind of how that fits together. Um, and that is a lipid bilayer. Oh, it's a bilayer because, well, you can see why. Um, there's molecules that are going down and the molecules going up. This is one layer, this is two layers. And then that's how the lipid bilayer works. That's how membranes exist and how they keep your cells and everything in it inside and the stuff that's outside, outside. All right, moving on to steroids and waxes. Steroids, um, these are ringed compounds. You can see the pictures up at the top. Um, that includes cholesterol and ergosterol. These just reinforce the strength of the walls or the uh, membranes. So we'll just go and say membranes. The cell membranes are reinforced and strengthened by things like cholesterol and other steroids. Um, so yeah, so this question is asking, what is the main function of a sterol? Uh, it's not for fermentation. It has nothing to do with anabolic reactions or energy storage or enzyme activity. We are talking about sterols and what they do for our membranes. That's the membrane stability and strength. Proteins are the shapers of life. Yes, this is very true. Um, they are the pr predominant molecule in cells and these types of proteins. And when I say a protein, man, that is a vague term, believe me. So um, I bet I can do, yeah, okay. Um, so to use my touchpad. Um, right. So they're made of amino acids, repeating amino acids. And we have a lot of different amino acids that we can use. There are about 20 in life that you can like program for. Um, and then we will talk about the DNA side of that soon. Um, but essentially every three nucleotides, so you have A, T, C, G, you know, all the different ones of that in your DNA, every three of those gives you one amino acid. And that's what DNA is. It codes for this. It, that's what it does. So, um, it makes you proteins like this. And isn't that something that that's like what your DNA does. And that's what it's going to code for is all these different proteins that help your body be your body as opposed to somebody else's because you're making your proteins and there's just a little bit different. So, um, because their genes say so. So that's how all of that works. And we link amino acids by something called a peptide bond. That's just that bond between that um, acid group and that amino group. That's all that is, okay? Um, these are the 20 amino acids over here on the left, we can see. And, um, you know, we'll go over that a little bit more, a little bit later, as far as when we're talking about transcription and translation, when, which is DNA to RNA, RNA to proteins. Um, and how all that works, but that's the concept here. And these are the general like shapes over here on the right of like what an amino acid might look like. We have the amino group over here on the left, that carboxylic acid over here on the right. And then whatever these groups are in these colored rectangles, make it whatever it is. So alanine has this orange type one, valine has these crazy looking purple type ones and so on and so forth. You get the idea. Okay, so a peptide is a molecule. So we talked about peptide bond. That's just the bond between each amino acid. A peptide is a short chain, a very short chain, like maybe seven amino acids altogether. And then the polypeptide has at least 20 amino acids minimum. 
and then bigger, usually a lot, a lot bigger. Okay. So not all polypeptides though are uh, going to be classified as proteins. A protein is a functional unit that has been made through this process. Sometimes you need to put several polypeptides together to make a functional protein. So they're not all just one unit. It can be more than one unit coming together, like as parts and they work as like a team. Okay, so we're getting into the structure of the proteins. The primary structure is just the amino acids. It's like what we were saying with DNA, the ATCG. This is those amino acids, the alanine, the valine, the phenylalanine, the you know, tyrosine, the tryptophan, and whatever. Whatever order those are in, that's like reading out the word, um, how you spell that protein out, right? So that amino acid, this amino acid, this amino acid, this amino acid, this amino acid for the whole protein. And it's just that sequence. That's the primary structure. The secondary structure, like I had said earlier, we'll start making a protein. Some of these charged areas interact with other charged areas and some of the hydrophobic water-fearing areas interact with other water-fearing areas. And they start to fold in on each other and create different shapes. These preferential shapes that they will make, we have categorized kind of in two ways for the most part, the alpha helix and the beta sheet. Please be familiar with that the alpha helix and the beta sheet start to appear in the secondary structure. That arises from how those amino acids will interact with one another. So here's pictures of the beta sheets, literally like flat, flattened out, right? That's what we're talking about, beta sheet, okay? The alpha helix coiled like a helix. Should be uh, simple or pretty simple to remember the shapes at least. Um, yeah. Moving on. So yeah, so definitely remember that secondary structure with the beta sheet and the alpha helix. Moving on to the tertiary structure. Now we have interaction between functional groups and those sulfide bonds that they can bond actually covalently across the way with one another. And that can cause actually like literal covalent, like permanent bonds, um, sharing of actual electrons, not just the charges now, not just interactions of attractions, permanent bonds um, and how those beta sheets and how those alpha helices start to interact with one another and how they might interact and, and you, know, you know, stick together or push apart. That's what determines the tertiary structure. Okay. So that's the structure of that polypeptide. Um, and then we have moving on to the quaternary structure. We have a multi-unit proteins that are formed by more than one polyprotein. Um, and those units can sort of um, interact with one another to create the functional protein. That's the quaternary. So primary amino acid, secondary alpha um, helices and beta sheets. That's how the amino acids interact with one another. Tertiary, how they, those secondary structures start to interact with each other, create the tertiary structure, as well as those covalent sulfide bonds. And the quaternary is the um, coming together of the subunits to make a functional actual protein. So what level of protein structure are alpha helices and beta sheets formed? And we just said that, hopefully you guys remember me having just said that two seconds ago, that is the secondary level. Nucleic acids, moving on. Uh, we have two forms of nucleic acids that are important in biology, the DNA and the RNA. And I know I keep saying it, but that is extremely important that you be aware of both of them and what their differences are and why they're different and how they're different. So deoxyribonucleic acid is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So that D is the deoxy, uh, ribonucleic acid. And then the RNA is just ribonucleic acid, ribonucleic acid. So those are the differences there as far as like the terms of what these structures are. Um, and what exactly are we talking about? What that, what that means? Um, then there we're talking about um, essentially that, you know, deoxyribo, we're having a deoxy, like one of the oxygens is removed. That's the difference there, like structurally speaking. Okay. And you can see it here. If you look on this picture over here on the right here, we have a hydrogen here and an OH here. So the deoxyribose has the deoxy. It's not, it's no more oxy there. So that's all the difference is there chemically. Um, and that's the idea of what those uh, sugars are that make them up. So you make up of one sugar, one nitrogenous base. That means there's a lot of nitrogen in the base. 
And then um, we have a uh, phosphate group. <laughs> I couldn't think for a second. And that's what makes a nucleotide. So that's when we say nucleic, we're made of nucleotides. That's the sugar, the base, and the phosphate group. The bases, what am I talking about? That's what makes it an A or a T or a G or a C. Or in the case of RNA, they don't use T. It just replaces the T with the U, okay? Otherwise, the same. So different uh, base, they use U instead of T. Uh, different sugar, it uses ribose instead of deoxyribose. So that's the difference between DNA and RNA, chemically speaking. We'll talk about their functions a little bit later, but this brings us into that concept of our energy molecule, one that we will be talking about a lot later on in uh, this uh, class, uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So that adenosine is at um, uh, nitrogenous base of adenine uh, mixed with a sugar, which is in this case is ribose, and then three phosphate groups. And when we break off that last third phosphate, it releases a ton of energy that the cell can use to power whatever it's trying to do. So that's ATP, similar to like the nucleo nucleotides, the DNA and the RNA stuff. So which of these is not a polymer? Well, these are all polymers. I hate to break it to you. So in summary, uh, we talked about the different types of chemical bonding. We talked about pH and what that is, the inorganic versus the organic compounds. Remember organic being carbons and hydrogen backbones, and then the biochemistry of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins and nucleic acids. Hopefully you guys can go back and review all of these and refresh your mind about which one is which. And if you have any questions about any of this, please let me know. These concepts are going to be carried on throughout the rest of the semester. So um, yeah, good, good talk. <laughs> and I'll see you next time. Right. All right. I forgot that my mouse doesn't work.